So good afternoon, everybody, and you're all very welcome to today's Enterprise Ireland Health, Beauty and Wellness UK Retail Workshop. Uh, my name is Peter Wade, and I'm a market executive for Enterprise Ireland UK, where I work closely alongside my colleague, Alison Stephen, who leads on the consumer and retail sector for the UK. I'm delighted to be joined today by Nigel Herman and Steve Hull from Ash Blue Consulting, um, who have over 40 years experience between them as senior account management and business development. Um, Nigel and Steve are experts in assisting companies launch, develop and manage their brands in the UK and Ireland. Before I introduce you to Steve and Nigel, um, just some quick housekeeping before we get going. Um, today's session will be recorded and a copy of the recording will be sent out to you all of you in the coming days. Um, I do encourage you all to please post your questions um, during the session. Um, we'll be getting around to all of, it, all of your questions at the end of each section. So please, I encourage you all to, to do get engaged and use this time um, wisely to engage with Nigel and Steve for any of your questions. Um, so I'm now going to pass you over to um, Nigel, who, who's going to take it from here. Nigel, over to you. Thanks very much, Peter, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on, on uh, this afternoon's workshop. Um, and I guess really the, the main objective of, of the workshop is to share really some of the experience and, and knowledge that we have of the UK retail market. Um, as Peter says, we have over 40 years of, of experience, and I'm sure you're looking at the screens thinking possibly that can't possibly be right with these two young lads, but uh, but it is. And um, we want to share really some of our um, experience of the UK retail market and approaching UK retail buyers. Um, what we have decided to do for today's workshop is really approach this with a bit of a blank canvas. And, um, and the reason for that is that there's obviously um, quite a, a wide range of brands uh, and companies on today's workshop. Um, at very uh, different stages of, of their journey and their development. So some of the areas that we're going to cover today during the workshop, um, some of you, of course, will be very familiar with, would have had experience uh, and knowledge of anyway. But of course, there are other maybe younger brands, newer to market, that, um, that we hope you know, will learn some of the um, some of the experiences that, that, that we've had. But I think by the end of today's workshop, we hope that everybody um, will be able to go away um, with, with some, some benefit and some value um, and, of, uh, and, and really that will help you um, and assist you in your approach to the UK retail market. Um, and of course, we wish everybody good luck with, with that. And I think as we go through um, the elements of, of the workshop today as well, it's maybe quite a nice idea to think of it as, as, as boxes to be ticked. And maybe as we go through um, and make some suggestions and give some guidance, um, it, you know, it could be quite useful just to sort of think to yourself, um, are these boxes that we as a brand and we as a company um, tick? So um, we'll just run you through a very quick agenda of what we're going to cover today. Um, and um, I, I think, I, uh, as Peter maybe just mentioned there, that um, if anybody has any questions uh, that they want to raise, please feel free to. Um, rather than do a, a big Q&A session at the end, we thought it would probably be more valuable um, and more relevant to ask any questions at the end of each section that we cover. Um, Steve and I will do our very best to answer um, the questions as we go through. Um, if there are any questions that come up that we are um, unable to answer, we will take them away with us and obviously we'll come back to you um, post uh, the workshop anyway uh, and, and, and help in any way that we can. So um, in terms of the agenda, I'm just going to do a very, very top line, a brief introduction to Ash Blue. Uh, just tell you a little bit about who we are, a little bit about um, our experience. Um, and then going to do a, a very quick snapshot of the, the status of the UK retail market because, of course, it's been an extremely challenging time uh, well, for all global markets, uh, but the UK retail market has gone through a lot of change. Um, so we just wanted to share sort of some insights really into current status. Um, in terms of the UK market itself, uh, it can be very challenging, um, but what comes with challenges are a huge amount of opportunities. So we've got a section during the workshop which will cover some of the challenges 
that you will, uh, I'm sure, face um, uh, with the UK retail market. And then we'll also look at some of the opportunities as well. Um, coming into the UK re retail market, it's absolutely crucial that uh, everybody comes in with sort of uh, eyes open wide and, and very clear and transparent around some of the commercial elements of dealing with UK retail. Um, so we've got a section here on business planning and commercials. Um, Steve's going to take us through um, a template that we use, which we find really useful in terms of uh, business planning. Um, and then, of course, one of the most important people in this whole process, of, of course, is the buyer. So we thought it would be quite interesting to actually do a small section on the buyer and have a bit of a, a bit of a dive in, really, to understanding more about what their role is and what their function is. Um, and I think that's quite, as we talk it through, I think you'll see it's quite important to maybe see things from the buyer's perspective as well. Um, and then also looking at what we believe the buyer is actually looking for. And so coming back to those boxes uh, being ticked, which I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so when we talk about what the buyer is looking for, I think it'd be really useful to, uh, again, ask yourself, uh, do you tick um, these boxes um, in terms of what the buyer is looking for? Um, the all-important pitch, um, we then do a section on uh, how to prepare for that um, and the presentation itself. Um, and then finally, we're going to cover some of the areas that you will be required to um, adhere to and to provide um, when your brand is successfully listed. So Steve uh, will take us through the listing process um, and hopefully that will be quite um, useful as well. And then at the end of it, if um, there still are, uh, are any outstanding questions, we can take them at the end before we close. So that's the sort of the areas that we're going to cover during the workshop. Um, Peter, if you could just move to the next slide for me, please. <coughs> Hello, Peter. If you can move to the next slide. Oh, that's fine. Off. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, um, yeah, I mean, Peter mentioned um, we, 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 we really assist companies in launching, developing uh, and managing their brands in the UK retail markets. Um, we, we uh, as I said, between us have a fair number of years experience in senior account management. Um, and also business development. We've also been sales directors previously for um, for successful uh, fast-paced companies. Um, and we have uh, really multi-channel experience across a number of se sectors, including pharmacy, um, health food, beauty, fragrance, hair care, grocery, sports and leisure, and TV home shopping. Um, it, such as QVC, so um, a fairly kind of, kind of wide range, but very much within the health, uh, beauty, and wellness space. Um, Peter, next slide, please. Um, so, just to, uh, again, a little bit of a snapshot as to some of the brands that we've uh, we've worked with there. Some uh, some really premium brands. Uh, Ralph Lauren, Giorgio Armani. Um, we've worked with a number of Irish companies, uh, had uh, the pleasure of working with a number of Irish companies. You'll see Slender Tone in there, and uh, you may be familiar with Viviscal, the hair supplements, uh, which again was quite a success story. Um, Micropedi from the foot care category, and uh, Sonic Chic, uh, which was a toothbrush brand. So just a, a bit of a snapshot there as to some of the beauty brands and, and healthcare brands that we've uh, worked with. Thank you, Peter. And then just in terms of um, kind of the four main pillars uh, of, of our business. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, so we secure product listings and increase distribution. Uh, we work with companies to develop strategy and uh, all important business plans. Um, and then senior account management we can provide as well um, if that is required, uh, if once a listing is secured. Um, and we, we have access to uh, a number of channels. Um, the next slide, Peter, just again gives a bit of a snapshot as to some of the retailers that we have worked with in the past. So I won't go through all these, but Peter, if you could just move that on for me.
Hello, so, Peter. Is there a bit of a time lag on this? Come on, yeah, buddy. there is. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry that's for the fine. delay, everyone. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, as I said, I won't go that's through fine. them, but you can see there's... So, uh, apologies about that. That's okay, Peter. No, a fairly wide range of uh, retailers that we've that we've worked with in in the past. So um, hopefully that just gives you a kind of a bit of background as to what we do um, at Ash Blue. Uh, Steve and I have been working together now for the last uh, three years. So that's a little bit about Ash Blue. Okay, um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, uh, Peter. There is a slight delay, I'm afraid, everyone. Okay, so the UK retail market goes without saying, it's been a, a hugely challenging uh, uh, 12 to 18 months, of course. Um, but we wanted to share with you really uh, our thoughts around where the UK retail market is now and more importantly, where it's going. Um, you know, it is, it is still a huge uh, market, the UK retail market, very challenging, but very exciting. Um, it is the single largest private sector employer in the UK, worth almost £400 billion. Pounds. So it is, you know, it's hugely important. Um, but on the back of uh, all the problems that we've had with the pandemic, um, the, the feedback and the vibes that we're getting from retail buyers at the moment. Oh, we've just lost the slide there, Peter. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, certainly the, the, the vibe um, that we're getting from, re from buyers. Sorry. There we go. Um, is is one of a real positive positive tone. Um, retailers are are really the whole retail market is 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 emerging as as a new landscape. It's a different landscape, and the words that we're hearing at the moment very much are around recovery, um, evolution, opportunity. There is a real positive feeling, and I think it's really important to grasp that. Um, Something, of course, that we're hearing all about in the media uh, at the moment is this accumulation of disposable income. You know, people have really saved up a lot of money because they haven't been able to spend it. Um, so there is a lot of money to, 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 for consumers to spend and everybody is desperate to get this feel good factor uh, back again. So there is a lot of positivity um, in terms of, of kind of what retailers are really looking for. Um, it's, it's brands that are relevant, um, brands that have purpose um, and this culture of inclusion that everybody's talking about. So the likes of sustainability and everything else is almost a prerequisite now that is required. But you know, excitingly, um, retailers uh, are focusing on specific areas more than others. Um, and one of those areas or, that have been focused on is around health and wellness, of course. Um, so for, I would imagine for everybody on today's call, um, that's really good news. Um, protection and hygiene, obviously, is another key focus area. Um, but retailers are looking for innovation. They are they're looking to invest in the future. Um, we know that retailers are really focusing on customer experience, and I know that as brand owners, you know, customer experience is important. But but for retailers, likewise, um, they want customers to come into their stores. They want them to to visit them online and to be inspired and, and entertained and educated. Um, of course, omni-channel development is, is, is a massive focus for, for all retailers now. And it goes without saying that we're, we're seeing huge growth of online sales. And the exciting thing about online development is that if, you know, traditionally with bricks and mortar retail, um, one of the biggest challenges ever is that, that this is, is the capacity of shelving to take more brands. You know, shelf space is so premium. The, the, the fabulous opportunity now for this growth of online is that it opens up much wider opportunities for brands because they're not restricted by the bricks and mortar. That's not to say that bricks and mortar retail is still hugely important, and we'll come to that in a second. Um, uh, but, but also the other thing, of course, that we've seen grow hugely in the last couple of years is the facility of click and collect being offered now by, by most retailers. And again, the beauty of that, if you get a listing with Holland and Barrett, for example, in their top 50 stores, with, the, with, with click and collect, it means actually your brand is accessible to consumers in every store of the country. So you have full access to their estate through click and collect, which again creates much wider opportunities for you as a brand. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting and really exciting that we, we, we've noticed 
is that uh, consumers are increasingly opting for smaller, newer brands that they consider authentic and innovative. So it's not just about the big brands, the big multi, multi, multi million pound brands. Um, customers are changing in their habits and they're looking for niche, more authentic and, and innovative brands. So I think, again, that's that's a positive, um, positive picture. Um, you know, where, when you hear all this uh, bad news in the media uh, of, of all sorts of things happening in retail, you know, people ask the question, is retail dying? Absolutely not. Uh, far from it. It's, it's evolving. There's a freshness and there's a real optimism. And we wanted to just touch on that today um, before we kind of get into the workshop, because I think it's encouraging and I think it's really optimistic. So um, just on the next slide, um, while we're talking about online, just got some, some data here um, from the Office of National Statistics. Um, and you can see there, and this just sort of shows you how, um, how dramatic really the online sales have been increasing. Uh, but in January 2020, um, online contributed 20% of total retail business in the UK. By January this year, that uh, has shot up to 36.3%. So, you know, this growth is huge. They are, and the anticipation, of course, is that over the next three to five years, I mean, it's probably going to equate to about 50, 55% of total business. But I think, again, um, to balance this out, the other important thing to note on the growth of online is if you've got 35% of total business coming from online, it still means that 65% of consumers prefer to go into store and buy from bricks and mortar stores. So there's opportunities for both sides of the business. Um, and I think that's important. OK, next slide, Peter, if you will, please. So on the next slide, we wanted to uh, look at some of the challenges um, and, you know, for any brand or company coming into the UK retail market, we think it's, it's crucially important to come in with eyes totally wide open and, and a good sort of transparent understanding and clarity about some of the challenges that, you, that, that, that will come up. Um, without doubt, you know, you will face challenges coming into this uh, aggressive UK retail market. Um, and it's important to recognize them. So we just wanted to cover off some of the challenges um, that you uh, will, will no doubt face. Um, the first one is buyer engagement. My goodness, how things have changed over the last couple of years. You know, you used to be able to pick up the phone to a buyer and, and have a conversation. And of course, this last year, particularly um, with buyers working from home uh, and remotely, you, you can't just uh, pick up the phone or go through a switchboard and speak to somebody at head office. Um, so uh, often the only way to communicate with a buyer is through um, email and of course they are absolutely inundated. So buyer engagement is a challenge. Um, commercial trading terms is always a challenge in the UK retail market. It's quite aggressive as I'm sure many of you will know. Um, retail margin can be very, very heavy. Um, in terms of expectation, typically you're looking at sort of between 50 and 60% in terms of retail margin. Um, but also promotional funding. You will be expected by um, most retailers to participate in a certain amount of promotional uh, activity. Um, primarily, you'll be expected to margin maintain that promotional uh, activity as well. We're going to do a little bit um, of a, uh, a section on promotional funding, which Steve's going to take us through an example of retro funding a little bit later on. Um, but it, you know, you will be expected uh, almost mandatory to, to participate in some of the key retailer uh, promotions. So, for example, Holland and Barrett, um, they run a, a buy one, get one half price promotion, tends to be about four times a year. You will be expected to participate in that. Um, if you have a VMS product, uh, Boots typically uh, offer a continual three for two um, uh, across their VMS category. So there are certain mandatory promotions but of course there are other promotions that you can get involved in all depending on the commercial uh, aspects of that um, other challenges you will face um, there may well be additional costs such as settlement discounts um, listing fees uh, some retailers uh, such as Holland and Barrett don't charge listing fees but they um, ask for free stock um, so these are all elements that need to be considered when you're building your plan. 
Um, in terms of, of a, bi a business plan support funding, um, again, you will be expected to support uh, a certain level of activity in store, online, um, partnership marketing, and within partnership marketing, that could well be um, a targeted email campaign. It could be getting involved in bounce back vouchers. There's all sorts of elements of, uh, of activity that uh, you will be expected really to, to, to get involved in. Um, it's all negotiable. Um, they will have rate cards and it's all negotiable and, and flexible to a certain extent, but it all needs to be factored in. Um, and then payment terms and cash, obviously cash flow is so important, uh, particularly to, to younger companies, well to all companies really, but payment terms again can be quite steep. Um, we're typically you're looking probably at around 60 days payment terms for most of the retailers. Um, boots, we believe, I think are up to 75 days now. We've even seen payment terms of up to 90 days. So that all needs to be factored in as, as well. Um, sorry, Peter, can you go back to the challenges slide for me, please? Thank you. Um, so other, other challenges that you're going to come across is the uh, category rebuild schedules. Um, now, for example, we were working with a US brand um, and we spent probably three to four months uh, talking to Boots about uh, getting this brand listed. We finally got a confirmation of listing in March last year, but because their reskills, re, sorry, rebuild schedule for that for their category wasn't going live till October, we had to delay the launch until October, um, and there was nothing that we could do about it. So. Um, you know, retailers, um, they all vary in terms of their category rebuilds um, and also categories within those retailers all vary as well. And sometimes that can be quite frustrating. Um, something that we're seeing as well more and more um, from retailers is um, uh, a reluctance, I would say, to, to set up brands as a new vendor. Uh, because of the work involved, the complexity involved, um, and you will find that often now they request if you can supply through a third party uh, distributor or third party supplier who is already an existing supplier to them. So again, we'll do a little bit more on that later in the, in the workshop. Um, marketing investment, you know, you will be expected to uh, invest in uh, elements of marketing, which again we'll cover in a bit, but typically um, you'd be looking at probably 15 to 20 percent allocation of marketing. So 15 to 20 percent of your revenue to allocate to marketing. Um, compliance with individual supplier manual requirements. Again, you, you have a hefty book of, of requirements which have to be complied with. Sometimes it means that you may have to change certain elements of of what you offer, whether it be packaging or pallets or whatever, to comply, uh, but can sometimes pr 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 um, can sometimes create a challenge. Stock forecasting is often a challenge because, particularly if you don't have a history of sales data for for that particular retailer, um, it can be uh, difficult to uh, to forecast and project what your rates of sales are going to be and what your stock forecasting is going to look like. And of course, that has impacts on your commitment to inventory and it can increase your risk. It's also um, quite difficult often to get a forecast or a projection out of the retailer as well. Um, and then finally, on challenges, we've included um, service level um, and compliance to service level. And uh, charges and fines can often be levied now for non-compliance. So, for example, um, if you are short delivering on a, on a product, um, some retailers will fine you because they see that as, um, uh, as a loss of profit. Um, often with retailers as well, deliveries have to be at a, a, a certain time allocation. And we've known in the past where the delivery drivers turned up late and the, 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 the delivery gets rejected and then fines are, implement, in, uh, are, are implemented as well. Um, but it could also be through non-compliance. So for example, if there are specific requirements in the supplier manual around um, pallet sizes, for example, and if you send in a pallet that isn't compliant, again, 
um, that delivery can be rejected and fines can be levied. So it's about really just sort of preempting all of those things and doing everything possible to avoid them. But we need, but we wanted to highlight them today because there are challenges that you could well um, come across uh, in the process. Um, okay, Steve, um, on the promotional yeah. funding side, do you yeah, want to take over? Thanks for that, Nigel. Yeah, I just really wanted to expand uh, upon the point that uh, Nigel was talking about in the commercial terms um, around the promotional um, funding. Uh, in nearly all cases now, uh, promotions are claimed for on a, a promotional retro funding, so it's done per unit. So if, for example, you're on promotion for four weeks, um, for every unit sold during that promotion, you will actually get a claim from the retailer at the end of that. Uh, and that's what they call um, retro funding. So really just to give a, a bit of an example of how that would work. Um, first of all, you would continue to uh, invoice your orders that are going in at uh, the normal invoice price. But here we have an example of a product that would normally sell at retail for £10. Um, the retailer margin, expectation uh, we've put in here at 50%. So the normal invoice price is £4.17 per unit. Then looking at the promotion, if the promotion RSP is a save of 25%, you'll be at £7.50. Again, with that margin maintenance for the promotion of 50%, the comparative invoice price is, is £3.13 a unit. So the retro amount claimed by the retailer will be the difference between the normal invoice price and the comparative invoice price. So in this instance, at the end of the promotion, um, the, the retro funding per unit that's going to be claimed by the retailer will be £1.4p. The claims are raised, as I say, at the end of the promotion, and it's based on all units that are sold either in-store or online. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Peter. So on the next slide, we just wanted to look at, we looked at the challenges. We wanted to just look at some of the opportunities of, uh, of coming into the UK uh, retail market. Obviously, it's a big market. Um, so you have the opportunity essentially to, uh, uh, to really have your brand represented in, in, in a huge amount of store distribution, extensive store distribution. As you know, some of the retail groups have a huge amount of store estate, um, but it's great for your brand presence uh, and exposure in the market, of course. Um, you have access then to huge consumer databases through retailer online platforms. We talked earlier on about the growth of online. And of course, the uh, the major retailers here in the UK just have huge, huge databases now. Um, and of course, loyalty schemes are hugely important and a, and a wonderful and effective, and sometimes more cost-effective way of reaching, um, uh, of reaching targeted consumers for your brand. So if you take um, Holland & Barrett, for example, with their Reward for Life scheme, it's been hugely successful. You know, they have many, many millions of uh, now of targeted, engaged, active consumers on their database. The same also for the likes of, of the Boots Advantage card. And there's a whole portfolio and plethora of, of activity that you can get involved in um, to actually target those consumers uh, through those, uh, those loyalty schemes. Um, of course, the UK retail market uh, creates an opportunity to really increase your volume sales and to scale your business, which in turn means that you can uh, scale up your resource. Um, it, you can often uh, uh, get a, a, better, a better, better cost of goods because of the volume increase. And it just obviously allows you to invest further in your business. So the UK retail market can, can have a very positive impact on your total business. Um, you can grow your consumer base um, and in terms of recruitment and retention so it, it allows you then to recruit more customers to your brand and then to retain them and to take them on that on that customer journey um, with your brand um, and of course by working with some of these major retailers as well it does increase your credibility not only to consumers um, but also around the world in other global markets. And, um, you know, we often hear um, with international opportunities that, you know, if you have a brand in Boots or in Holland and Barrett or John Lewis or whoever that may be, it, it carries a lot of weight in other international markets as well. 
Um, in terms of supplier routes, we, we touched earlier on uh, around third party suppliers, which is um, you know, increasingly something that's requested by buyers. So uh, essentially, the, the, there's kind of three main routes into the retailer. Um, one is uh, as a direct supplier, as a direct vendor. Um, one is through a third party supplier, as we spoke about. Um, and the other in interesting uh, opportunity potentially for some brands um, within some retailers is the whole concession route. Um, and that is where um, you, you own the stock, you, um, there are concession distributors, certainly we can introduce you to, to concession distributors who um, you have ownership of the stock at all time um, and you get a commission on every product that you sell through that retailer, um, a commission which is shared between the retailer and the distributor. Um, but it often means as well, not only do you have control of your stock all the time, um, it means that you can often uh, recoup your, your, your money, your funds much quicker than the traditional direct vendor uh, approach. So uh, again, we can cover more um, detail around the concession um, opportunity if anybody is, is interested in that. Um, in terms of business development, you know, we talk about this snowball effect, um, particularly for a brand um, kind of in, in the early stages of development. You know, sometimes it just takes one major retailer to land, and then interestingly, it, it's quite fascinating to see how others will follow. So we, we love to talk about this whole snowball effect. Um, we touched earlier on around the growth of online, and as we mentioned earlier, Yes, there might be 30, 35% of consumers um, buying online, but there are still 60, 65% of consumers who prefer to purchase in store. So there is still a huge opportunity to, uh, to, to get your products listed in traditional bricks and mortar retail. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so <clears throat> Just uh, moving on to the, the business plan uh, now. In this section, we'll take you through um, a model, uh, a business plan model that, that we use, uh, and it proves to be a very robust tool when you're looking at the whole uh, commercial model. Um, it allows you to, to have the confidence and complete transparency in the, the commercial framework, and we'll see what that looks like in a moment. Um, but it also allows you to look at, you know, best case scenario, um, worst case scenario, so as you really know where your breakpoints are, uh, and where potentially you've got to negotiate a lot harder with uh, with the retailers. Um, but what it does do, it builds in a number of assumptions and projections. So looking at the whole sort of pricing in terms of um, retail price points, looking at the margins that the retailers are expecting, um, looking at the promotional activity and retrospective funding that we covered off uh, a little bit earlier. Um, it also allows you to play around with store distribution as well. Um, not all products are necessarily going to be launched in the same number of stores for each retailer. It also looks at the rate of sale, so the average unit rate of sale per unit per store per week when a product is not on promotion, and also uh, a pipeline volume as well. So this is the, the volume that a retailer will initially order to ensure that they've got enough stock on the shelf but also possibly carry in uh, a number of units in the warehouse so that when stock does start to sell from shelf, they can immediately replenish before actually placing another order with yourselves. There's also uh, additional discounts that uh, could potentially need to be factored in. Um, settlement discounts, for example, Nigel mentioned about the number of days or payment terms rather that retailers are now working to. And it could be the fact of, of giving an extra half a percent or one percent um, the, on, on the, from the invoice that you could reduce your payment terms down from maybe 60 days to, to 45 days. Um, some, a company like QVC uh, work with a, a platform contribution, so they will actually charge every single one of their suppliers 0.75% of their revenue, um, which goes, goes towards the whole production cost for QVC. Um, one area which is not an assumption, um, it is actually a, a known cost within your business, is your own cost of goods. So that gets factored into the business plan as well. Um, we look at freight charges. So what is the cost of transporting freight from, let's say, your warehouse directly into a distributor or a retailer's warehouse in the UK? And then variable marketing fees and costs as well. 
Um, and that can be anything from uh, taking a page to advertise your products in a, in a magazine such as Boots, Holland and Barra, Superdrug, Tesco, Sainsbury's, etc. Um, to a cost of, of participating in a promotion in store where you're actually paying to have a shelf barker uh, at the at, at where your products are actually sold on the shelf, advertising what that promotion is. And depending on the category, you could be looking at a cost of maybe two and a half thousand pounds for a promotion period for that. Um, we also look at uh, them more importantly, what is that delivering to you as a gross profit? Um, taking into account any other marketing costs um, such as above the line or PR costs uh, and then finally looking at what is that as a gross contribution to you as a business. So Peter if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide um, actually takes us through an example and basically the, a number of the cells here um, yes they're all formulated but a number of them you can actually input the data yourself and this as I said earlier allows you to look at the best case scenario and also worst case scenarios. So we've just made some assumptions here around three products, uh, retailing at 29.99, product two at uh, 16.99, and then the third one at 14.99. Working with this retailer on a margin of 50%, so you've got your invoice price per unit there, of 12 pounds 50, 708 and 625. We then factored in what the retro um, per unit on promotion would be, uh, and that's based on a saved 20% uh, promotion. So you've got the, re the retail promotion prices there at 23.99, 14.59, and 11.99, and what the promo per unit is. So that's the 250, 142, and 125. But then made some assumptions um, in this number of stores products are going to be listed in or distributed in. So 500, 300, and 200. And then that pipeline that I mentioned that it gives maybe two, three units on the shelf, but some actually in the, the back uh, of the warehouse to pull through. We've then made assumptions around the, the weekly rate of sale um, per store or per unit per store per week. Um, when a product is not on promotion. And then when then we have factored in the number of weeks that a product could be on promotion for throughout the whole year. So we've worked on three four-week promotions, so 12 weeks for the year that you'd actually be on promotion. And then a promotional multiplier as well. So if you're on promotion, you're saving 20%, what kind of uplift do you expect to see? And we've put in here a one and a half times uplift. So this um, delivers the retailer sales um, throughout the year of just over 1.7 million. We've put in some of those variable um, costs, such as site fees, which could be paying for a gondola rent in store, um, other partnership marketing that, that Nigel referred to earlier. So we've put those costs in at uh, 20,000 and 40,000. Um, We've made an allowance for return, so a consumer doesn't like their product, they take it back, or a product is faulty, or you've got damaged goods, uh, as an example. So we've put that in at half a percent. I mentioned the one area that is not assumption, it's a, it's a known cost within your business, which is the cost of goods. So we've put those in there. Um, you see that in 438, 248, and 219. And then the freight charge which I mentioned, uh, allowing for 5% of the uh, the invoice price to actually get product shipped from your warehouse to uh, to the distributor or the retailer's uh, warehouse. So you've got a summary there then of what that is as gross sales to use a business, which is just under 966,000, uh, delivering a gross profit of just over 374,000. Um, so that's working out at 59.8% as a growth prof, gross profit percentage. We've put in some additional marketing costs, um, as I mentioned about above the line or PR. So we've factored that in 80,000, which taking into account all of the marketing costs, the 20,000 above, the 40,000, the 80,000, and also the uh, retro um, funding for promotions, Brings, brings it to just over 196,000, which is around that 20% mark that Nigel referred to earlier. 
So overall, it would deliver a gross contribution of 377,000 or a percentage gross contribution of 39.3%. So really just a, an example for, for illustration purposes only, but it just allows you to, to play around with uh, a wide number of figures and assumptions, et cetera, just to see what that business plan could look like for that retailer. Thank you, Steve. If you could move on to the next slide, uh, Peter, <clears throat> please. So um, we mentioned earlier on the uh, the all important uh, buyer, who's uh, pretty uh, pretty important to this whole process, and um, just wanted to kind of take a bit of a deeper look into understanding what the role of the buyer is. Um, uh, do you know what? There's there's so many uh, times that you, you know you can have the most the, 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 the greatest brand, the greatest proposition for a buyer, um, and you send an email or you send some information through, um, you know, and you feel terribly excited about what you've got to offer, and then nothing. You hear nothing back. You get no response or anything, and it can be soul destroying, and it can be very disheartening. Um, and I think, you know, it's important, therefore, to actually take a look in, and understand more um, the role of the buyer to try and understand maybe why you're not getting a response. Um, because, uh, you know, it shouldn't be taken personally. It's no reflection of the brand. It may well be because the buyer just hasn't seen it or hasn't got to it. Um, and it's so important to keep persevering and not give up, even if you don't hear anything back. Um, so just to, uh, to sort of help put some, I guess, some flesh on the bones around that in terms of the role of the buyer, um, just wanted to take a look here at some of the, of the areas that they're involved in. And it's quite interesting. Um, so, of course, they source brands and they source suppliers that will grow their category business. Um, they're constantly analysing data um, and market trends and, and, and analysing consumer behaviour. Um, and then most interestingly, they, they're trading the business. Um, uh, it, very interestingly, only, 15, only 10 to 15 percent of their time is actually spent on brands. The rest of the time is around trading their business. So again, if you, know, if you don't hear back straight away from the buyer, um, they're dealing with so much more than just brands. Um, they're engaging multiple teams and departments within their business internally. And that could be marketing, uh, the digital team, the PR team, supply, et cetera. Um, they have multiple targets and KPIs that they have to meet. Um, they have to engage, obviously, with suppliers, new and existing. Um, they have to manage their emails. And if you talk to any buyer, of course, they are um, have overflowing inboxes. Um, they have regular meetings and calls with suppliers, both new and existing. Um, and they have lots of regular internal meetings and reports to compile as well. And then on top of that, they have to manage their category, category review programs. Um, and uh, something that we're seeing quite often at the moment, actually, is buyers are being pulled away to, um, to internal projects. Um, you know, we've, we've had experiences quite recently of trying to get buyers that we would normally have no problem contacting. Um, and they, they've been taken off into uh, other internal projects. And I think partly because there's a lot of restructuring going on um, at the moment within the retail businesses. So um, they have a huge amount to do. And, you know, um, when we go on to the next slide and we, we have a look at what is it that the buyer is looking for, I think, you know, it's all about making everything as simple as possible for the buyer. The easier you can make it for them, the more responsive they're going to be, and I think when we you know when we when we actually really understand what it is that they do, um, that kind of helps to uh, I think really endorse that that we just need to kind of almost wrap up and bundle everything for them and make it as easy as possible. So on the next slide, Peter, if you will, it's just taking a little bit of a dive here into uh, some of the the areas that we think the buyers will be looking for in terms of their, their, their brands um, and their NPD. Um, uh, and, and, and again, like we said at the start of the workshop, um, maybe see this, this kind of slide as, as a box, as a number of boxes. And as we go through them, maybe just ask yourself, um, you know, are, are you, can you and your brand tick these boxes in terms of what the buyer is looking for? Um, certainly, NPD, despite all the challenges that retail has been having, NPD is still vitally important and a huge priority for retail buyers. 
Um, but what they're looking for is newness. They're looking for innovation. They're looking for products with, with USPs. What they're not looking for is Me Too products. So it's really important to demonstrate to them that you have something that is, that is new and innovative and unique. Um, they're looking for brands and products that will drive and provide incremental category value. Um, there's no point in them bringing Me Too products in that, that is just going to uh, create no, you know, no category increase for them at all. So it's about demonstrating to them how you can add incremental value to their category. Um, alignment to market and consumer trends. So is your product something that the market is looking for now? Is it in line with, with the current consumer trend? Um, and also, does your brand um, align to that retailer's customer demographic? And that's really quite important, you know, and it's, it's important to understand what their retailer demographic is so that you are, uh, you know, if, they're talk, if, if their demographic, demographic is particularly mature and you have a product that is very young and trendy, then, of course, that's going to create a challenge and not necessarily what that buyer is looking for. Um, they're looking for, for brands of purpose, relevance and inclusion, as we touched on earlier on, and they want to, to, to work with brands that, that can be trusted and have the validation. So therefore, um, you know, if you're making efficacy claims about your products, they want to have that belief and trust that those efficacy claims um, can be validated and that you have the right certification and all of that um, that goes with that. Um, they want brands that have a good commercial fit within their category margin model. You'll hear this all the time from category buyers. They refer to their category margin all the time. Um, but it's important for them as a buyer that they're not having a product coming in that's going to erode that category margin. So that's something that they very much consider as well. Cash margin. Um, you know, if you have a, a product that has a particular high price point, that will that's of interest to them, obviously, from a cash margin perspective. But also, you know, they look at products that are going to increase their average transaction value and their basket value. Um, and also, they want brands that are going to drive incremental footfall and traffic to their business. Um, they want to see brands that have a clear plan of how you're going to support your brand. You know, it's not enough to have a great brand. They want to know how that brand is going to be supported, how that awareness is going to be uh, created around your brand. Um, so they will want to see evidence of a marketing plan. Of what is your PR and social media strategy? Um, what is your promotional plan? Um, do you have all the digital assets and content that you can just provide to them? It's about wrapping all of that up as a bundle and being able to uh, supply that and, and make their job that much easier. Um, and then something that uh, also is important to a buyer is, again, it's, it's if you have a great product, they want to know that if, if they were to put you in a huge amount of store distribution, can you uh, scale up your supply to make sure that stock is available and that you can supply that stock? The last thing they want is to put you into uh, into wide distribution and then you can't um, scale up and supply to demand. So those are some of the things that um, that uh, that buyers will be looking for. And, and as I say, if if those boxes can be ticked, that's a real positive move forward in terms of success with that buyer. Thanks, Nigel. Um, Peter, if you wouldn't mind the, the next slide, please, um, which is sort of uh, getting ready for uh, the pitch and, and really very much around the whole preparation side. Um, and really, sort of before approaching a retailer, you really need to make sure that uh, your homework is done, the research is done, so that you are fully prepared and really understand the retailer and the, the category in the market that you're, you're looking to go into. So, you know, really knowing the retailer, their focus, their vision, their direction, a lot of this can be gained um, by researching online, looking at uh, corporate websites, et cetera, which give quite a lot around focus and vision. Um, but it always pays to actually get into store as well and see what is actually happening on the, the ground level. Um, Nigel mentioned about the demographic of, of consumers. Make sure that the products that you're going to them with, um, that you are aligned with their demographic uh, consumer profile. Um, really, really key on, on that one. And, and also taking into account any new product development that, that may be coming down the line as well that you're thinking of presenting to them. Um, researching their categories, 
to ensure that you are pitching to the right buyer. Um, you get some retailers where buyers may cross over a number of different categories, or you may have a, a category specific buyer. Um, but a great tool for this to identify the right person to, to approach is actually LinkedIn. Um, knowing your competitors, um, a, an obvious one, but who are you up against and, and what is your real point of difference? So, you know, how are they merchandised and presented in store? What's their promotional price points? How many times a year do they promote? Um, taking all those things into account. Um, study and market data and trends to identify the demand for your brand and, and a gap obviously within that retailer's business. Um, a lot of information um, again can be accessed online sort of free of charge but it may also be a case of investing in more detailed market data if that's required and there are companies around that, that specialize in that. Kantar World Panel is a very credible source uh, and partner um, to, to access market data. Um, being able to demonstrate strong customer reviews and consumer endorsements, um, very, very powerful because obviously it's demonstrating to a buyer that there is a demand for your products within their business. If on your own website or uh, dare I say Amazon, that you've got possibly, you know, 5,000 five star reviews, really shout about it because it's really going to get the, the, the buyer's interest because it's a, a product that knows that, uh, that they must have. Um, prepare samples um, to send them promptly to the buyer. There's nothing more important than sort of real-time follow-up here. It shows that you're obviously organized as a, as a company um, and making sure that they're packaged carefully and presenting them well um, actually shows that, that obviously you care about what you're sending to them, but it's also all about making that first impression. Um, I know of companies that have sent samples, liquid samples that have actually leaked on buyers' desks when they've actually opened the, the, the packaging. Um, and this is a, a very obvious one, but personalize and individualize any email correspondence. Um, it may sound stupid, um, but always check the, uh, the spelling of the Christian name of the, uh, the buyer that you're approaching um, uh, and, and, and tailor make your, your email approach as well to them. Um, don't just copy and paste from uh, another email. Um, we have seen examples of whereby uh, somebody has written to a buyer at Superdrug and at the bottom of the email it says we look forward to actually working with you at Boots. Um, doesn't go down well at all. <laughs> uh, Nige, back over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, on the next slide, if you will. So just in terms of the actual presentation itself um, and the, 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 the sales deck, if you like. Um, <sighs> So some of this may, may be fairly obvious, but you know it's important just to, to, to mention, keep your presentation, uh, particularly bearing in mind what we went through about the role of the buyer. Um, they haven't got time uh, to, to go through slides and slides and slides. So keep your, 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 your pitch, your presentation deck short, sharp, concise, and of course, relevant. Um, keep it visually strong, um, you know, uh, present it visually so it's not just full of copy. Too much copy, um, you will lose the buyer, they won't read it. Um, so, so bring it to life, make it, it, it exciting visually. Uh, but as I said, keep the number of slides to a minimum. Um, go straight in with a strong brand proposition. You know, sometimes, you know, we see presentations um, that that start off with information about the company and about the brand and the journey and the history and all of that kind of stuff. And whilst it's interesting to a buyer, they 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 they're not particularly interested, um, uh, and and you you will lose them straight away. So if you've got a strong proposition, just go straight in with that because that's what they're looking for and that's more relevant to them. Um, give them a reason to believe. Talk about marketing trend. You know, your brand is bang on trend. Um, if you can highlight to them that there's a gap in the market, maybe there's a gap in their business that you've identified. That's the sort of thing that will resonate with the buyer um, and that they will want to see and that will grab their attention. Obviously, talk about your, your key brand uh, and your product USPs. Um, proof of efficacy, we talked about earlier on, is important. So if you have clinical trial, highlight highlight the results 
um, certification and validation. It comes back to what we were saying about trust and validation earlier on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, consumer reviews, as Steve said, such powerful. I mean, consumer reviews now are just vitally important, as, as, as everybody knows. So if you've got great customer reviews, great and relevant testimonials, really build them up and shout about them during your, your, your presentation. Um, and then demonstrate that you have a marketing plan, uh, a PR and social media strategy. Show them how you're going to build brand awareness and how you're going to create and drive this demand. Um, and also that you have a promotional strategy in mind um, and prepared, um, but that it will be um, uh, relevant to the framework and model that they have. So we talked earlier on about Holland and Barrett and their, their bog ship promotions. Um, so, you know, build a promotional strategy in line with how they, they currently structure their promotional activity. Um, and then finally, you know, it's good if you can demonstrate as part of your pitch a strong commercial projection. Um, obviously, this is based on certain assumptions, but it could be, for example, that you, you, you present that if, if that buyer puts you into uh, lists you in 500 stores, this is what you believe you will deliver in terms of sales and profits, and that can be really powerful as well. So, yeah, keep the presentation short, sharp, but really powerful, and think about what it is that they they will be interested in, what's going to tick their boxes, um, and um, you know, go back and think about um, all those boxes that we talked about, and and, and build those into your presentation. Okay. Um, then providing, uh, sorry, I was going to say just on the, on the basis that then you are successful and you get a listing with the retailer, Steve's just going to talk through some of the requirements um, and, and areas of work that will need to be completed. Yeah, hopefully sort of the, the, the final hurdle, um, apart from actually delivering the stock in. Um, so very much around the listing process. So regardless of, of whether or not you're actually trading directly um, or through a third party, um, obviously, there's a huge amount of information that's required by the retailers to get products set up. Um, so really, all of the information on, on this slide is, is requested. Um, vendor setup, um, if you are supplying directly, um, obviously, you'll need all of your company information. Um, financial information, you may be asked to, to list your, your last three years turnover. Um, contact details, so who are the key contacts within the business from sales director to supply chain to QA, etc., um, all need to be provided. Um, but then the area around sort of the new line forms and the data that is actually required by the retailers, um, full project product logistics. So what are the dimensions of not only your consumer unit, or the weights of your consumer unit, but also for the outer cases as well, um, or master cartons that hold multiple uh, consumer units. Um, product codes, obviously you're gonna have your own uh, product code for your individual products. Um, barcodes that are recognized by uh, GS1 um, that would need to be used. Um, different formats for um, outer uh, case barcodes or master carton barcodes. Um, versus the traditional EAN uh, consumer unit barcode and commodity codes as well. And there may be additional uh, information required around that. Packaging information. Um, retailers now are wanting more and more the details of actual packaging and outer boxes, et cetera. Um, and that's really so as they can comply to, to waste, me uh, waste um, uh, measurement um, uh, issues. Pallet details as well, um, quite straightforward. How many layers on a pallet for your products? How many, how many, um, how many units on a on a layer? Um, how high is the pallet? A number of retailers now have a certain uh, height limit that they will accept pallets for, uh, and also uh, weight of pallets as well. Um, compliance with the su supplier manual. Nigel um, highlighted that a little bit earlier. These really are sort of thick books. Um, that you really have to get your, your teeth into uh, and know inside out. Um, and that could also be around um, label inside as well. So certain products may as, must have certain labels on, labeling of pallets, et cetera. Um, your trading agreement or terms and conditions um, basically is your, uh, your contract with the retailer to supply goods. Um, product samples, uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier on. 
uh, including QA samples where required. So the likes of QVC will require samples that have been signed off by the quality assurance team first before you can even progress with uh, a, a listing. Um, and then finally, really, all your digital assets. So making sure that you've got good product images, um, bringing, bringing products to life, um, the right content and copy for the website. Um, also for a small fee now, you can actually um, find out the key search words that uh, competitors have actually used for, uh, for their products. And then finally, the whole education piece for the retailers and training of um, store staff. So if you take Holland and Barrett as an example, they spend a lot of time and energy in actually training their staff um, to make sure that they're, they're fully familiar with the products that are being sold within store. So key number of areas there, um, but it really comes back to what Nigel said uh, just before this last slide, that it's, it's essentially, it's with all of the above, it's about making the job easier for the buyer. If you tick all those boxes, uh, that Nigel's previously talked about, it just makes the, the buyer's job uh, a lot easier. Thanks. Peter? Thank, thank you, Steve. Um, we're just about up to an hour, so um, I think we've we've covered the sort of the main areas that we wanted to today. Um, if anybody's got any questions, obviously please uh, please post them and uh, up on the uh, the question chat there, and we'll 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 answer them uh, as best we can. Um, but but it, you know, essentially, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot in there that will be already familiar and obvious to uh, to a number of uh, of brands um, on today's workshop. But hopefully. Um, it's given some sort of further insight and, and has been of, a, of some help to, uh, to, 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 to you as well. Um, in terms of preparing to, to pitch for, for UK retail business, and as we said, it's, it is challenging and there's a lot of things to be factored in uh, to, your, to your business model, but it's also a hugely exciting and a very rewarding market to be in as well. Um, we can certainly send on any information that anybody wants to uh, ask for specifically, whether you want some copies of new line forms or a copy of the template for the business plan or whatever, we can send those on. And if you just um, request those through Peter, uh, you know, with our pleasure, we will uh, we will send those on to you. And, and if there's anything that we can help anybody with or anybody wants to have a separate conversation um you know we we're, 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 we're very happy to help in any way that we can um but uh, i suppose just to finish from our point of view we wish everybody uh, all the very best uh, of luck and success in the uk retail market um you know we know there are some fabulous brands um within the enterprise island clients and uh, um you know Buyers will be interested um, in these. Um, Ireland, I think, is recognised for its innovation and it's an exciting time for retail anyway. So we wish you well. Um, we thank you for your time today and uh, we'll uh, hand back to, uh, to Peter. Yeah, just, you. just beforehand, uh, Nigel, we have got a, a question come in. Um, is, uh, one question is, is there a move to more UK manufactured products post-Brexit? Um, and that's that's not something that, that we have seen um, specifically in terms of UK um, manufactured. Um, it's not something that's uh, that that we've been approached about. Nigel, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I, I, I do. I think the whole Brexit area is um, is still fairly complex, and I think uh, everybody is still trying to find their way through on on Brexit. Um, uh, w w you know, we. I think if anybody, if anybody has any specific questions around that, please let us know um, again through Peter, and we will, we will try and find answers. But, um, but you're right, Steve. I don't think we've seen any kind of particular, tangible um, example of that. No, no. So just a few other comments coming through, but I can't, can't see any other specific questions. No? Okay. Uh, Peter, we'll have a question, guys. Sorry, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to let you off the hook that easily. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just want to, well, firstly say thank you. Um, that was a real practical way through around the whole process of being listed. Um, I would hope there'd be a few more questions coming through, but maybe everyone's a bit shy today for some reason. But I've got a question around this concept of the buyer. 
So, um, obviously, buyers within big retailers, they don't work in, in, in isolation. They're part of teams. So when you say buyer, are you talking about some kind of category director or a product specific buyer or assistant buyer? Who should brands target? Should it be someone really senior or try and get in at the more junior level? And also, how do buyers interact with the rest of, 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 of the teams within retailers? So the likes of NPD and supply chain, et cetera. Could you just elaborate about this concept of the buyer? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's a very good question. I mean, category teams are quite quite, uh, quite wide. Um, there are a number of people involved. Um, we always find the, the best approach initially is to the buyer uh, as opposed to the assistant buyer. Um, quite often, um, if you don't get a response from the buyer, this is where the likes of LinkedIn come, come in uh, very, very usefully. Um, so we've, we've had a number of, of, of experiences, I guess, where we have, um, and, and sometimes it's not always clear whether the buyer that you're approaching actually is the right buyer for that particular product, because uh, particularly they're, they're moving around quite a lot as well. There's been quite a lot of structural change. Um, so it, it may be an idea, and we've certainly done this and had some success in uh, actually contacting maybe the commercial director or the category uh, director um, and asking them to, uh, to, to, to send on or divert your, um, your, your, your email to the appropriate person. Um, so I, I think, yeah, and, and you know, we talked about some of the challenges, Ali, around buyer engagement, and I think one of the genuine challenges has been this moving around of of, of, of people, um, amalgamations of categories. Uh, you know, um, some of the retailers have streamlined their their resources and reduced their category uh, number of heads, um, and so some categories have amalgamated into others. Um, but I think, you know, you're right, I mean, to, to, to contact somebody more senior, they should be able to direct you to the right, uh, to the right buyer. Okay, thanks. And what about this, the, the second part about the interaction with other, other parts of the, the retailer? Is that something that, that the brand has to do directly or, or would the buyer direct all that? Um, it's, it, it's, it, that, that comes as uh, sort of after the initial contact, really. Um, you wouldn't necessarily contact somebody um, without going through the buyer first. The only exception to that, I would say, is QVC. Um, an interest, QVC is an interesting one because it's so, it's so um, it, uh, much around um, compliance and claims, on-air claims, and legality of, of on-air claims. So uh, what you often find with QVC is it's best to approach their legal department before you approach a buyer, um, just to say that we have this product, this is the claims, these are the claims that we want to make, this is the substantiation that we have for those claims, um, are you, would you be happy as QVC for us to, uh, to make those claims on air? Once you have that approval from the legal team, uh, you can then approach the buyer. Sometimes if you approach the buyer, um, they will just kind of throw it back or ignore it because you haven't got the approval on the claims first. Um, but with normal kind of retailers, I would say the buyer is the first, uh, is the first contact. Um, and then as the process develops and you need to engage other departments within the category, whether it be around social media, PR, NPD, logistics, supply chain, that will all be introduced through the buyer. They, they tend not to be particularly uh, keen on you uh, approaching other areas of their business without going through them. Okay. Does Thanks. that make sense, Ali? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hop off now and Peter can take any more so, questions or wrap it uh, up. So I'll, another I'll let you is Here. Thanks, Ali. Thanks. Um, so another question here, uh, as an Irish brand selling into the UK, we get a lot of questions on UK brand awareness. Do you have any advice on how to overcome this? So this is going to be very much around the whole uh, marketing educational piece um, and around how you can actually use social media, certainly Facebook, et cetera, to drive your brand awareness within the UK, um, as well as um, other general areas of, of your marketing campaign. 
Yeah, I, 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 again, we've had examples in the past whereby um, some of the brands that we worked with, some of the Irish brands that we worked with, have um, tried to elevate their social media activity, homegrown activity into the UK. We found a greater level of success when there's somebody on the ground here in the UK in terms of, a, of, a, of an agency, a PR, social media entity. Um, that can that can focus and generate activity from the UK, um, and that tends to I think. And then what often happens is it, it goes back the other way that um, activity that is generated uh, here in the UK is then shared um, with with Ireland uh, and with the, um, the 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 the, uh, the presence in Ireland there. So. Um, yeah, I, I think if that if I understand the question right, um, it's it's I think it's good to to drive uh, brand awareness here in the UK market. Not sure if that answers that properly for somebody, but yeah. Okay. okay. Another question here: Can Ash Blue do the initial contact? I think let's um, we can pick that up uh, separately. I think as a as a response to that one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. I mean, if anybody wants to uh, again reach out to, to, to us through through Peter or anything, uh, you know, we'd be d delighted to uh, to help in any way that we can. Yeah. Um, there's another one here. So I'm trying to navigate my way around the question panel. Um... <clears throat> right. So if I've got this here, we. Just bear with me. So we are a small Irish owned tannin company in the final stages of going live with a new tannin product. This is a Mastage product with a low RP. This is due to launch in May 2021. We're in negotiations with Superdrug to have this brand listed with them. Part of their agreement is to have promo funding for nine months out of 12. Sorry. Does this seem excessive and have you experienced this level of funding activity before? I think, I think it is excessive. Um, I think it's a question of a, a, a buying team starting um, extreme, wouldn't you say, Nigel? I, I, I do. I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, a retail buyer is always going to push you for to spend as much money as you possibly can. That's the reality of it. They all have their own individual uh, targets and budgets to achieve in terms of funding. Um, so you will always be pushed. Um, and again, I go back to a brand that we launched into Holland and Barrett. Um, and we were asked to complete, um, you know, a full business plan of activity throughout the year. The brand that we were working with um, found it quite um, restrictive in terms of the commercial aspects because uh, they didn't have a great deal of margin to, to play with. So we essentially had to play fairly hard ball with Holland and Barrett um, and, 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 and just say that we, you know, we, we couldn't participate, but we would participate in... Um, activity where we could. So, you know, we supported the bog ship promotions. Um, and interestingly, Holland and Barra haven't necessarily pushed back on that. So I think it all comes down at the end of the day to how much that retailer wants your brand. If they really, really want your brand, you can negotiate all of these things. So in terms of nine months, I mean, it depends what they're looking for. Um, are they looking for um, those promotions to be margin maintained or is there flexibility around what you can contribute to that? Um, is, is that level of promotional activity right in terms of your overall strategy? Um, there's kind of a lot of um, considerations there. Um, I would say nine months out of 12 feels excessive. But um, and if the if the person that's asking the question wants to to maybe make contact with separately, maybe it'd be good to understand that a little bit more um, and to get a better insight into where you're at with the negotiation. And we can certainly help and uh, maybe offer some uh, some guidance and advice on that. Yeah, good. OK, another one here. Are buyers more likely to test new products online or in the store or does this depend on the category? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and I would say yes, they do test online. It's 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 a lot easier for them to do that without committing to um, uh, to 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 on shelf presence. 
Um, plus, with on-shelf presence, they uh, you know that's a much more complex uh, area for them to to plan for. Whereas they can uh, get products listed online a lot easier. Um, and and often, yes, it is a test bed. Um, you know, again, in the past, we've worked with with Boots where they have um, said, well, let's run a test online. Um, you, you know, the, the, the only drawback to that, I'd say, is you have to be really confident that your brand is going to sell well, um, because if it doesn't and it's not a success online, they're not going to roll it out in store. But it, the simple answer really to the question is yes, often online is, is, is seen as an, a great opportunity to test the success of your product. Um, if it is successful online and they really see an opportunity for development, they will roll it out as quickly as they can to stores. But again, depending on the whole kind of um, rebuild, category rebuild accessibility and, and, and schedule. But uh, it's a great opportunity. But anyway, I, I mean, as, as, as online sales are growing so much anyway, um, you know, if you get your brand listed with these major retailers online, it can be hugely successful and drive serious volume. So um, it's certainly a, a, a great way to go if you have the chance to, to get your product listed online. Yeah. Uh, another one here. Are buyers generally open to being contacted by suppliers on LinkedIn or, or, or connection requests? Or do they want to avoid the impression of stalking? I think that's, that's a great question. I mean, LinkedIn, as we said earlier, is, is a great tool to identify um, who the right person is to approach. And to get an email uh, format to approach them is, is quite easy these days. Um, I think you can share a lot more information through email. Um, and it does look a little bit more uh, professional in terms of the approach. But we have, we've, we've contacted people directly through LinkedIn. Uh, and made uh, uh, connections with them um, and certainly don't get the impression about stalking. I think actually recently here in one buyer um, actually welcomed the fact for uh, people to go through LinkedIn uh, to make contact with them. So I wouldn't worry about that. The key, the key to the LinkedIn approach though um, is, 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 is grabbing their attention um, with something very relevant to them uh, straight away. Uh, so this comes back to what we were talking about earlier on. Um, you know, it's identifying straight away, you know, a brand proposition that is going to tick their boxes. Um, you know, do you ident is, there a, is there a gap in their market that you can highlight to them? So it just needs to be very powerful and very short and succinct, but something that's going to um, attract their attention. Um, and it also goes back to what Ali was saying earlier on um, as well about sort of maybe going to a more senior level to, 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 to get to the right buyer. And again, LinkedIn can be a great opportunity. And, and, and it is quite easy, as Steve says, to find out who the heads of category or the category directors are. Um, and it's certainly worth trying an approach through them as well. Yeah. And that's that's it. That's all the questions I can see. I don't think I've missed okay. anything there. Peter? Hi, guys. Thanks a million for that. Uh, really, really excellent presentation. And uh, apologies for all the, the technical difficulties we had in between. But um, yeah, if I just go on to the next slide here, um, uh, you can just see our contact details on the screen. Uh, myself and Ali would be delighted to hear from you in the next few days or weeks if you have any questions or just like it, to have a quick uh, follow-up chat. Um, we do encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter just to keep up to date with all the, the most relevant news updates. Um, and if we didn't get to any of your questions today, please do contact us um, and we'd be happy to follow up. Um, so thank you again, Nigel and Steve. That was fantastic. Um, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you much, everyone. Bye, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Mm-hmm.